Um, hello, I'm your host, April Altman Becker, and I'm the Dean of Educational and Cultural Resources here at Solross State University. I want to welcome you guys to another lecture in the series, The Solross Spotlight. This is an online monthly lecture series open to the public that highlights the expertise and research of Solross State University folks. The Spotlight is sponsored by the PAC First, and that's our professional development initiative. The mission of the Division of Educational and Cultural Resources is to connect our resources with our campus and community and to make the most of our special offerings and enhance the quality of life on campus and throughout our communities. So today, we are spotlighting Dr. Lisa Sousa, who is an assistant professor and program specialist in the Education Diagnostician Graduate Program here at Solrest State University. Her students are mid-career professionals that participate in the online program. Out of a need to engage with her online learners, Dr. Sousa developed techniques that help with student engagement and scaffolded instruction for students of various abilities. Her research interests include psychometric assessment and online accessibility. Today's talk is entitled Evolving Towards High Flex Courses and Multimodal Instruction, the next step to engage with your students. In today's session, Dr. Sousa will describe tools to engage with students using multimodal methods. This introductory course will provide step-by-step -step tutorials so that beginning instructors can get started if requested. So whether your instructional and delivery is face-to-face -face or online, this session is going to benefit you. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get really started. Um, if you're having issues uh, seeing the slides or anything like that, um, we're standing by for tech assistance on the Microsoft Teams chat. So enter your questions there. Your mics and your cameras are muted today so that we can all hear and see the presentation without distractions. Today's lecture will be about 40 minutes and there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. So enter your questions into the chat as you have them and at the end of Dr. Seuss's presentation, I'll read the questions and she can answer. So without further delay, hello Dr. Seuss. Thanks so much for being our spotlight today. Um, we've all been waiting to hear from you. So the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you for that introduction. That was wonderful. Um, yes, it, it, the title is called Evolving Towards High Flex Courses. And I, and I want to assure you all that I'm not shooting all over yourself. You can choose any piece of this however you want to do it. And it is an evolution. It's not something that you have to take on all in one shot or at all. Uh, this is just going to be kind of this overarching presentation on some Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 things that you can introduce to your classroom, uh, but you're probably already doing it. So um, that's kind of how I fell into this. So my research has always been on focusing on accessibility for those with disabilities, especially uh, web based accessibility and uh, for students that are culturally and linguistically diverse. So those are my two interest groups primarily when I do any of my research. Uh, this year I'm focusing on e journaling and I'm focusing on screencasting in a number of ways. And from there, it led to high flex instruction, which sent me down a rabbit hole. And high flex sounds really cool, but again, y'all might be doing some aspect of this to get towards high flex. So today, what we'll be doing is um, we'll be talking about high flex and um, you know, we'll define it. We'll talk about multimodal instruction. I'll give you some benefits and, and some ideas as to how to apply it. So a little bit of background with me is I've always used web enhanced instruction, even in my face to face instruction with in higher ed. It evolved then to hybrid learning. And then when I came to Sewell Ross, it was also a hybrid program, but I primarily taught online. We eventually transitioned from a hybrid program to a fully online program. And as I said, uh, the, the people that I serve are mid-career professionals. They're teachers, and so they can only access the content typically after their work hours. They have family obligations. They have aging parent obligations. And then in that time in life, you, you're dealing with uh, things that are out of your control, like health issues, um, divorces, et cetera. And so I need to uh, needed to kind of figure out a way to support my learners. They also are in multiple time zones because all of my learners are across Texas. 
And um, so we have mountain time and central time that I have to deal with, and I only have a finite amount of time in which to help them. Additionally, when you're becoming an educational diagnostician, you are assessing uh, individuals for services and you're determining whether or not they have a disability. So this can be in uh, K-12 classrooms, but it also can be out there in the community. So that's how we as educational diagnosticians uh, practice. So with that, I had to come up with strategies to kind of help them because some people typically they have some experience with uh, individuals with disabilities that are in my program. Others have very limited exposure to the continuum of learning and the continuum of disabilities. So I really had to scaffold my instruction to be able to support uh, a diverse, diverse learners. Um, we also had COVID hit. Um, so a lot of us had kind of pivoted from face to face instruction to COVID. So those those were always issues as well. But I also had to address some biases as I went through uh, uh, evolving my my program to where it was 100 percent online. I had alumni uh, reach out when we sent out our press release saying, nope, face to face is the only way. And then when we had COVID hit again, I had instructors that were using it as a, a stopgap or a means of instruction while they couldn't meet face to face, but they didn't believe in the merit of providing online instruction. They felt that face-to-face uh, -face was far superior. And I'm not really here to debate that point. We all do our own thing. And again, this is a very safe place for everybody. So just keep that in mind. But when I evolved to a high flex practice, I had no budget. And so I, I pretty much had uh, a lot of, uh, of empty information and shelves that I needed to, to fill in my program and I had to do it in a way that was free. <laughs> so with that, when we're talking about high flex instruction, which I'll get to in a moment, let's talk about the continuum of instruction. And we're talking about asynchronous, synchronous, hybrid or blended, our, our usual face to face and then multimodalities. And so with multimodality instruction, which I'll get to in a minute, it can incorporate a lot of these uh, facets of instruction. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through kind of a, a sterile definition of each of these types of instruction. But really, when I say continuum, there's a definite overlap. Our face-to-face -face instruction, even when we're teaching traditionally face-to-face, -face, can be web enhanced. When we're talking about asynchronous instruction, we're talking about kind of self-directed learning where the modules are put in place and the, the learner goes through and they access the information and then they test on the information. And, and that's just kind of a, a very sterile definition, as I said, but you can have synchronous meetings. You can be meeting face to face, but it's just less than. You can have those synchronous meetings. Again, it's going to be less than. When we're talking about synchronous instruction, we're talking about live instruction. It's what we're doing right now. I'm talking to you live. Uh, there can be other components to that, but the primary type of instruction will be as I'm speaking to you right now. Then we have hybrid or also known as blended courses. And that might be kind of a week on week on format where you're you're in class one week, but the next week you're accessing your learning objectives uh, by either asynchronous or synchronous means. Which brings us to high flex and really high flex is multimodal. You're using all of those tools or those techniques with instruction. You're using web 2.0 and 3.0 instruction, but students can choose. It's, it's a more of a self-directed kind of learning. They can choose their mode of attendance and instruction. And so with these come great benefits when we're talking about high flex, you, the students can access at any time. Um, it covers issues with winter closures, COVID, student absences. You're able to provide la layers of support where if you have learners that are kind of newer to the field compared to those that have more experience. You can provide different modalities where you can help facilitate their learning and their growth. So it's not just all teaching to, um, 
you know, just the basics. You're really enhancing your technique and it creates a connection. You can create a connection with your learners, uh, even if it's online or with synchronous instruction. As I said before, HyFlex has to do with, a, with choice and self-directed learning. You don't have to worry about attrition with your face-to-face -face or um, synchronous instruction. I haven't found that to be an issue. Uh, but again, you really are, when you're in a HyFlex scenario uh, with your courses, you're providing opportunities for self-directed learning because that's something that we all appreciate even as instructors when we're learning new things. It supports inquiry-based instruction, uh, project-based learning, and it meets the, it can meet the learners where they are while providing that professional growth and development. So there are a few tools that I used uh, a lot in the beginning to start this process. The first being Animoto, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And that was where I was very comfortable with talking to people online in a syn synchronous format, but God forbid I had to record myself and post that. For some reason, that was very anxiety provoking for me. It was going to be out there in the interweb for anybody to look at and access at any time. And what if I made a mistake? And so I really started taking the baby steps before I would put um, my online interactions with my students in a place where they could access at any time. So Animoto was one of those tools that I used and I'll, and I'll I'll go over that. I'll provide an overview of that. And then it turned into um, providing uh, webcasts of myself where I was just talking to the to the camera, recording what I was going to say and uploading that information. Um, some other things that I used were webcasts as well. Uh, I'm sorry, screencasts. And I did that to provide content as well as to provide support or what's called feedback to my students. And again, I'll go over that in just a minute. So in easing myself into HyFlex, one of the things that I did was I just looked at, and again, I'm speaking generally because right now I don't have face-to-face, -face, but I'm gonna speak like uh, a professor that has a face-to-face -face format or synchronous format. Uh, what I did is I, as I made sure that everything kind of paralleled uh, across a couple of universes, so to speak. So I would have my my synchronous or my face to face in one area where I would be speaking with my students and I'd be handling those learning objectives. But then I'd also come over and I'd have an asynchronous uh, format as well. And this is something that you can do where it highlights again and it hits the same learning objectives. And again, you're not perfect in what you're doing, so it can be kind of supplemental. Your, your online can be supplemental to your face-to-face, -face, but that's definitely something that can help you as well. Um, I would also uh, provide assessment that was flexible. So I'll go over how I used assessment in just a minute. And one of the things that I want to impress upon y'all is that take an inventory of self of who you are as a learner. We all learn in different ways. And so start to think about the last time you learned a new skill or a new technique, what was the best way for you? And where did you go to grab that information in your self-directed learning process? Other things that I would suggest to you is as you're uploading information into your courses, on make sure that they're PDF, so that we can have uh, readers be able to read the content to those that have sensory issues. So always make sure that you upload in a PDF format. Now I'm talking about the benefits, but this is not, it'll ameliorate some of the problems that you have, but it's not going to extinguish them. You will always have to go back to your students that have questions of, did you check the syllabus? Yeah, it won't be perfect, um, but it will save you time in the fact that you can direct students to different resources. It can reduce the amount of redundancy of questions, which I have found. And it's not to say that you are dug in to just doing things online. Um, you can still, when you're providing feedback in this one-on-one, -on -one, you can do it live through Blackboard Collaborate. You can do it live in your face-to-face -face interactions. So just keep that in mind that while it ameliorates some problems, um, you're still going to have situations 
where you will get those questions and you think I, I literally just said that and I, and I've had that where I've I've literally just said something and then the the question that pops up in the chat box was was a question that I had just covered but it wasn't tangentially related or anything it was as if I never said anything so these things happen and just be, have a lot of grace with that we're not perfect by any means as instructors and even as learners and so just show a lot of grace when that occurs and uh, meet people where they're at don't expect perfection in your transition. Think of it as a continuum. And my program is ever evolving. I typically will take one to two tools a year and I'll try to incorporate that into my uh, courses. One of the things that you'll find as I, as I walk you through some of my courses is one of the bad things that I have is sometimes folders within folders. And that's that's a big no no, apparently. Um, and my new uh, interest will be in evolving towards instead of just basic Blackboard to uh, you know Blackboard Ultra. And when, again, when I started all of this, I didn't have the support of the uh, Sam Houston. So this was all pre Sam Houston. And as I've gone through, I've had to kind of figure it out, but just like you i can get pretty overwhelmed with the amount of professional development changes in my coursework all the things that we need universal university responsibilities it can get overwhelming so you know stay where you're at it's cool or or when you're ready move forward but the point is is just start somewhere and so again take an inventory of who you are as a learner i always went back to youtube to blogs uh, when we're talking about peer review uh research i really wasn't looking at those white papers or those journals but i was definitely referencing them and i do use them for evidence-based practices for 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 some of these techniques so when i'm talking to you when i'm when i'm giving you kind of overviews as to um how to do some of these techniques there there is a layer of evidence-based practice research that's in that's involved with this. So I'm not just uh, giving my experiences or you know, it's not just conjecture. It's it's really, you know, trying to uh, have it be supported by the research. But do as you're learning these things, th inventory yourself. Remember when you realize that you were a kinesthetic learner. Great. Uh, but Think about how you interface with some of these resources as, as well and consider um, adding them to your coursework. So you have a couple of options in which to start, which I'll go over and I like. One is e-journaling and e-journaling uh, starts back, we, you know the journal, you've done journals in, your, in school, uh, but e-journaling, it goes back to Howard Gardner and we're talking about our interpersonal uh, relationship to the to the curriculum or to the content that we're learning about. Interpersonal means our reaction to what we're learning. And so what I did is I did some some journal entries and and that's a place to start when you're trying to transition your students to kind of go back and forth. Um, e journaling is about getting them to reflect and uh, apply oftentimes what they're learning. I find that e-journaling works best with my with survey courses in the beginning, but I do use e-journaling in different ways as the courses get more and more sophisticated. Uh, but if you need a resource, I, I've just uh, put something in faculty focus. I'm published in there. You can read about that, but I'm also available online. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my one of my courses here. And this is human growth and development. So as you see, I've got my learning objectives and, and that's something that I would do whether or not I was in a synchronous face to face or more of an asynchronous format. The learning objectives for the week always remain the same. And I'll go over how I structure things in just a minute, but just to go over the self reflection journal. Uh, typically what I do is 
is I tie in last week's learning objectives. We kind of review them a little bit. We tie them into what we're learning about this week. And so in this instance, what I do is it has to do with social media and Facebook and, and uh, Facebook, Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and, and issues with cyberbullying. And then I try to uh, put a theoretical slant into it. And when I do these self-reflection journals, I don't judge them on their grammar or their spelling. And it's just a quick two paragraph put in. It's, it's very stream of consciousness. It's just about getting them to engage with the content on a different level. It's different than discussion board. Discussion board is where they're interacting with each other. Um, I think of my, with this year, of my respondents, uh, maybe 5% were really keen on the journal and they didn't understand the difference between uh, discussion board and journal. And so the way I, I'll explain it to y'all is that when we're going back to Howard Gardner and those multiple intelligences, we talked about the interpersonal, but they're, but discussion board is interpersonal. They're interacting with their colleagues and they're talking with their colleagues about the content. So discussion board for me is always about new materials. Uh, journaling is always about reflection and incorporating the previous material. I also and, and so that's about, you know, discussion board is, is construction con, constructivism, excuse me. And again, this is where they're the, the only audience is you and them and really what I do is I use a rubric, okay? I use a rubric so that they can self-assess and they're self-assessing in two ways. They are self-assessing um, their content and then they are also, uh, you know, did they respond to the content and did they make a personal connection with um, what they learned? So, or a professional connection as well. So let me go back to the PowerPoint slides here. Sorry about that. See, nobody's perfect. I should do a grid here. I have a feeling I'm going to be doing this a couple times as I go back through. So the way you curate content beyond the TED Talk are some of the things that I said before. You screencast use OCR, uh, uh, ready PDFs, um, you can podcast, and then note the time involved on the specific tasks when you do do something. So in my courses, there's a number of things that I do or where I started in this process. I'm a little further along now, uh, given that I've put the layers in, but where I've started uh, has been with um, doing an Animoto overview of what's expected in the course, um, making sure that I uh, have a place for synchronous instruction and where people can, can get together. I have a course use module. I have introductory, interact, introductory screencasting as well. Um, what and then what I have is pre recorded lectures in there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and share. Again. My screen. And you can see here where. Um, when I meet people where they're at, they're usually they're usually met in the coursework with a landing page that looks like this. So their first two weeks, it starts here. And what I did in this instance is I modified the HTML and I uh, had it so that they understood the objectives, when they were meeting, how it looked. And, and I'll show you some different examples of this, some first steps and where to start. So let me see if I can move this out of the way. Good. So here's my landing page for practicum and here's my Animoto and I'll just quickly show you where we're at and how it looks. Notice it points to the resources here. Uh, 
Also, this is only like a minute 45. So I'm not spending a lot of time. I'm just gonna be a general overview. I also have a link for the video. Um, I have practical students that aren't the best at reading the paper or responding for the observation. So this is something that I had to put in, but put in in kind of a key way. Uh, but you get the gist of it. So I'm 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 not even talking in this one. I'm just showing them six little jazzy animated on what they would be doing. And so you know, in another course for what I'll do, for example, if you're trying to, I embed my synchronous meetings here. And in the beginning, uh, it's definitely listed as seminars. For this particular class, what I found is people kind of, they, they got the gist of it. They were uh, not as interested in or needing the synchronous format like other classes. So then what I would do is I just create a study hall here um, that was that was standing. And so if there was a concept that I needed to hit and I needed to hit it live, they knew when to go, they knew where it was, and then I always would record it as well. Um, for this course again, um, I would also have a course introduction, which I'll show you in a minute, which I kind of showed you before, but also even in my modules, I would use uh, screencasting as a way of introducing them to the week. I would give them, uh, you know, the lecture and here I am here giving the information. You also have a cursor just like you're seeing here and it walks you through the week and some some extra information here. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't tests. There are tests that are usually or assessments that are at the bottom. So this is just one example of of how I do that. So let me go ahead and get back into sharing high flex. Thanks for your patience. And so again, as I've, I've gone through, here's an example of just an orientation. I usually have a some information or an audio overlay on this, but you can see how I'm going through. I would be talking in real time, telling them where to go, where to find the information. And that's something that I kind of did with you all as well. So that's just a little quick thing that you can do for the week to introduce, <laughs> introduce information to your students. And again, it's all about layering. You know, don't take it all on at once. That's an impossible task. Just try one new thing and uh, you know, you'll know, you be ready to go. So I was talking a little bit about assessment. Uh, we had the self-assessment where students could actually rate themselves uh, using a, a rubric and really that's a head fake. I've never had a situation where a student you know, went rogue and wrote something else and awarded them point values. The head fake is in the fact that they were really able looking at the rubric brick and uh, assessing themselves. They they did exactly what you wanted them to do. They evaluated. Did I tie in my personal and professional experience into the content? And so um, you don't have to worry about that too much with respect to people doing silly things. I haven't experienced that. We do have summative and formative assessments that I do. Your summative assessments are you know, assessments where that yield a grade that really don't have opportunities for revisions. It, it's, it's typically what you think about test quizzes, essays and projects. And if they have their, their uh, essay response that they have to provide or their, their paper, um, when we make it a summative assessment, there isn't really room for them to kind of grow as a writer. With, um, with my program, technical writing and uh, psychometric assessment are huge. And so with that technical writing, they're constantly growing 
in their application and in, and in their performance. So a lot of these things that I do are formative assessments before my summative assessments that I'll do around week eight and week 12. And then I do have quizzes. Uh, but my formative assessments are going to be where I am providing them information and it's a back and forth. They've, they've sent something to me, it's their best work. And then usually I'm, I'm uh, giving them uh, guidance. Okay, now you need to revise it here. This is what I mean when I said this. So my students in the beginning, it's it's nerve wracking for, for them, but they get very comfortable in accepting feedback and revising. And so I'm going to give you two examples of that of screencasted right now. This first example, uh, I hope you can see it big enough, is where uh, it's descriptive statistics class and they've all administered their first protocol, their, their, their babies. It's their first time doing it. And um, so what I've done is I have shown them because they're having some issues what they needed to do. All right, sorry about that. I'm just kind of So you get the gist of that. What I'm doing is I'm giving a screencast and I'm using an example to um, to provide feedback for because everybody came back and they all had different issues. So I just walk them through line by line. You know, what is confidence interval? What's this? What's that? So I walk them through it and then I thought it was so good. I'm like, well, geez, I'm just going to plunk that into my content for next semester. So there's a way for it's not a wasted experience when you do a screencast. You can you, you'll you'll be doing it live or you can post it in announcements or you can send it off to their email when they they have a chance to take a look at it. Um, and then eventually if you really like it, well, then you might just incorporate it into content. This second uh, example is an example where I am providing feedback or feedback to written work. And so these students were kind of, it was a collaborative project. They were a little off the mark with what they wanted to do, but I wanted to give you this example for screencasting feedback, which is known as feedback. So I'm going to pause it right there and notice that well there's one the first thing that I, I did wrong I'm going to be honest with you is that I didn't open with a positive when you give feedback always open with a positive but do notice my conversational tone notice that I use their names that's how I open but always start with a positive before you start launching into the criticism criticism so that wasn't the best example but what was good about it is the fact that I used the highlighting and annotating feature that's in Blackboard for that. I was able, I, I have specific information in there where I highlighted what I meant, I gave a little blurb, but again, even in face-to-face in -face, when we're turning those papers back, we're, we're having a small amount of margin space to uh, kind of interact and, and give feedback to annotate. So do make sure that our best practices include when we're providing feedback, include highlighting, include annotating, and then also layer the next component, which is the audio and visual. It'll, it, it'll happen so fast. 
um, you'll see. Uh, when you first do it, it, it can be a little overwhelming again. Don't worry about it um, because what you're going to do as we did a number of years ago with Kornstrom uh, and with our online, we did that book study um, and I apologize, I can't remember off the top of my head. So if y'all remember uh, how, how, to, how to give good writing feedback, um, what we want to do is not just edit their work, we want to give examples of where they need to grow. So that's exactly what I meant when, um, when I said adding that audio visual component, because you're going to highlight, you'll give a little annotation. For example, my students struggle with APA sources and APA formatting issues. So I'll just say, well, I found it here in the screencast. I'll say I found it here, 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 and here. And so you provide those indirect kind of corrections, but it gives you an ability to provide some depth as well. So the benefits of screencasted uh, feedback or feedback, it saves you time. It's a better use of your feedback. You know, it, it increases the layers. You get a rapport with your students and it supports those uh, multi-modality and it's kind of web 3.0 based. And it reduces, um, it reduces redundant feedback with your students. So here's what my, my students have reported when I've incorporated th these things. Um, I do have students that are on their second master's degree and they have reported hand to God that they felt a greater connection with the faculty and that's a testament to the faculty. I am not the lone per, uh, person in my program. We rely on other faculty for our program to provide that content. That includes Dr. Miller, that includes Professor Hayes, uh, that includes all of our, all the people in our education department that are all working uh, online to provide that content. So they felt a greater connection with their faculty when we did things like this. Uh, additionally, um, they would say that they felt supported, uh, that we cared, and they were amazed at how they could connect with their classmates. They're already doing those um, Root Me apps and they're talking about you. So you might as well find a way to control that and, and not have information filtered through your students but find a way to engage directly with them. So you always have a student that say, well, we're all having problems with, great, go to the meeting room. Let's all discuss this or put it on a screencast. Notice here that, you know, you can't make everybody happy and I wanted to include this as well. Okay, I, this was a situation where I had a student where I, I did all these things and I met them live and I referred them to our writing uh, lab to get some extra support, but stick to your guns, stick to stick to what you your learning objectives are for that course. If they don't earn the A, don't give them the A. And but do know it's not just about relying on these things, but I do also in addition to these things have to meet live with my students as I'm providing feedback sometimes as well. So that's kind of tongue in cheek, but you know, it does happen. So, you know, where do you start? Start small and start somewhere. It can be overarching or I'm sorry, overwhelming, but uh, I am here for you. I am here for you. I am happy to collaborate at any time. Uh, I can provide more information either through a brown bag or something with how I introduce some of these things. And additionally, one of the things that I didn't show you was use of badges. So I, I didn't, for sake of time, I didn't show everything that I've used. But if you want to collaborate on research, if you just want to know what I'm doing uh, or how to incorporate it or lockstep how to do things, you can always reach me via an email at lisa.susa at soloross.edu or we can schedule a brown bag, whatever you like. I'm, I'm happy to be there for you. And so with that, I will turn it over to questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one question right now, and I bet that this will spur on others, and I bet people are, are typing right now. So the first question is from um, Dr. DeHart. So Dr. DeHart says, thank you, Dr. Sousa. I really appreciate your tips and suggestions. Quick question. Do you have any advice about how to structure an undergraduate versus graduate course? Are there any specific considerations we should consider between the two? Um, Actually, 
I would structure it in the same way that I structure my graduate courses. I do have one undergrad course that I did show you, and I use all the same techniques. So when I showed you that highlighting and annotating and giving the feedback, I absolutely do that for my undergrad. And again, it's just about the learning objectives. So um, when you're talking about high flex, you're talking about um, mirroring and uh, you know your, your synchronous or live instruction with asynchronous in a sense. So um, survey courses are the easiest I found. You know your your survey courses are always going to be the easiest to introduce that, but I can spend more time later uh, going through how I structured that undergrad course, but it's pretty much the same as how I structure my my graduate courses as well. It's just the graduate courses tend to actually uh, just be a little more sophisticated and um, involved, but that's not to say that the content is any different or the load is any different. Awesome. I see a couple people typing, um, and while they are, uh, Jennifer Miller, uh, Dr. Miller Ray said, great tip about the screencasting. Um, positives with specific targeting, letting our students know that we know their names really builds community. That seems simple, but that's an important piece. Yes, yes. yes. Good, okay, we've got another question. Um, first up, I put your email, Dr. Sousa, in the chat, and so Rhonda Hayes has already emailed you. Um, okay. Kayla Wagner asks, have you noticed a difference between undergraduate and graduate students listening and watching the feedback and then applying it to future assignments? Um, I haven't no, I haven't really did a did a comparison. A lot of my students that took my course really uh, were pretty much face to face. Some of them were first time with um, with their exposure, uh, but not many. Uh, most of them had had some level of of exposure to online, especially given COVID and everything. They all kind of had to start at the same time. So I haven't seen that much difference. But what I'm going to tell you is that the challenges that we face here at Sewell Ross are the same challenges that Ivy League institutions face that that need to connect with our learners, the scaffolding of, of instruction that we need to do. Um, you know, some of the, the problems that we have we think are unique to Sewell Ross. They are not. They are across the board. And, and that's why I really wanted to present on this because it's happening everywhere at every level and uh and we're kind of we're we're working on an island in a lot of ways as faculty um while we have our our um our faculty development and things that we can do and, and interests that we have they um we want also want to make sure that we're not alone in this endeavor and if and so we always reach out to our uh instructional uh faculty as well our instructional support for some of these things but having somebody on the front lines doing it can really help you as well but the engagement can be a little different i find for my undergraduates with the survey courses let's say um they kind of in the beginning it's very intensive and then they get the gist of it and i don't have to meet with them so much live and then they just kind of run with it and they 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 have a good inertia is the best way i can describe it great okay i think we might have a couple more questions coming through you're getting lots of great tips and and thank yous um let's see well i don't see anyone else typing Let's see if anyone has a final question, go ahead and enter it there. Give y'all a couple minutes, a couple seconds here. I, I, sh I should mention something while, while people are typing. One of the things that I looked at in my research, especially for e-journaling, um, is whether or not it was trauma provoking. Because in my um, in my uh, human development class, there were issues where we're talking about gender identity, we're talking about acculturation, we're talking about um, LGBTQ 
issues and, and, and trying to relate to that. And that can be, and, and I'm asking them to tap into personal things. And so that can be trauma inducing. But what I found uh, in my response from my students is that, no, nope, they got it. And they were able to kind of moderate how much they wanted to share or not share. And so trauma was not an issue. And so that was, that was something that I was very pleased to see. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I do think you should follow up. Uh, maybe we can get a brown bag or something or an additional spotlight or something because this has been really practical, really, really helpful information, I think. So, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime. So <laughs> Oh, good. OK, we'll <laughs> we'll remember this. <laughs> um, so thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Sousa. Um, I, I, I really do think we learned a ton today. So um, let's see, I see a couple people typing, so I'll slow end it just in case. Um, everyone here is going to get a link to the recording of the lecture and everyone that registered for the lecture that wasn't able to attend also gets a link. Um, and that should be coming out in a couple days within the next week. So you'll also see a three question survey that you can fill out to let us know what you thought of today. Um, should we do more things like this? Who else would you like to hear from in the future? So this is our last spotlight for the semester, but please keep an eye out for us. Um, you'll see emails, you'll see other publicity um, promotion for upcoming talks. So I hope you guys have a great Friday. I hope you have a great weekend um, and we will see you next time. All right. So thanks, Dr. Sousa. Thank you. All right.